if you were a small town priest, what would you ask the Pope? What would I ask Arnold Steinhardt about violin, about teaching to get the most out of your students, about recording for passion rather than perfection? This and more inside music on text. <laughs> What is your advice for students today? Students that want to either thrive as a musician or just recreationally utilizing YouTube as a means, because I get this a lot with my students. They come in, they're, they're trying to play it right away or say, oh, well, I listened to this on YouTube and that's how it should be. I said, well, now hold on, <laughs> but I don't want to feed your answer. So I want to I, want well, I, love you. I love you too. You do. And the evil sidebar, because <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you like that, you may like this on the <gasps> side. And suddenly two and a half hours have gone by. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? But um there's there's a piece by Edvard Grieg for piano. It's wedding day at I forget the <laughs> The Norwegian word Trollhagen. Trollhagen, yes. Is it Trollhagen? I think Trollhagen, yeah. So I was driving in the car and listening to our classical music station here, and that came on. And I loved the piece and I loved the way the pianist played it. You, you could feel that it was wedding day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you could feel the joy. It was just. Oh, and it's it's a very popular piece, as I understand it. But I didn't realize it at the time. I thought, gee, this is so wonderful. I think I'll go to uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll find one. Well, I found something like 40 recordings of it, including Edvard Grieg himself. Wow. Gee. <laughs> and I was able to say to myself, Edvard, I think it's a little too fast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is real chutzpah. I'm yeah. telling the composer how he should play his own music. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I could hear all these different things. You remember this old-fashioned piece called Souvenir of Durdla? Of Durdla, no. Souvenir of Durdla. That tells me how young you are and how old I am. <laughs> because... For my teachers, everybody played this. It was a cute little piece. And I could hear Chrysler play it, Heifetz play it. Yes. Eugene Ormandy play it, who was mm. a violin. Actually, Dollar, Eugene Ormandy, yes. And, mm. and you get this panoply of, of artists playing a piece for its technical expertise, but more important for the stylishness. Mm -hmm. of it and i think for a student at first it might be confusing oh my god which which version do i like best but i mean ultimately you can't just be somebody else you have to grow into being yourself yes and i think all those experiences of, of hearing yehudi menuhin playing this and david oistrach playing this etc it just goes into the brain and the heart and the stomach and gets regurgitated, you know, it gets processed. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I think, well, I think this is the way I'd like to play it. So I don't see anything necessarily dangerous. <laughs> it, it was the same for me. I wanted to copy all my, my heroes when I was young. But, right. you, I mean, the people who remain copiers of other people's playing, they're the ones who are under, basically undeveloped mm -hmm. as, as musicians and maybe as people. Right. I mean, there were so many people who fell under the hypnotic, hypnotic influence of Yasha Heifetz. And you can hear it in the recording industry when there's a, a hot solo for a romantic 
film, you know, uh -huh. where they're saying to one another, I love you. And you hear this, this violin in the background with this hot, fast vibrato, you know, that these people have been under the, the influence of Yasha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And movies, that's fine. But when they come out and play a violin recital, I don't want to hear Yasha Heifetz, except when Yasha Heifetz is playing. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, I think it's great for students to be able to go on the internet. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the, the Opus 118 project and what that resonated with, how that resonated with you and what involvement you had with that. It was chronicalized in Music of the Heart. Music of the Heart. And then before that, the documentary, Small Wonders. Small Wonders, that's right. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, R Roberta Guaspari was the violin teacher, and I didn't know her. And she taught in the New York City. She taught violin in the New York City school system. And she was terrific. And everybody, she's in the inner cities. Mm -hmm. So there were all kinds of kids who, who might not have had the fancy upbringing to to study music on their own privately <clears throat> and she was a terrific teacher and there were so many kids who wanted to study with her that there was a lottery system wow. and she sent out a, a mailing to all kinds of musicians because she was fired she was dropped from her school and i thought she's she taught in not one but three different inner city schools because New York City was cutting out its its arts program, which right. is all over the uh, the country, unfortunately. I know about that. So she is a feisty lady besides being hugely talented as a, as a violinist, as a teacher. And she said, I'm not going to let this happen. I'm going to start my own... 401k or not 401k but my own project right. and I'm going to have people contribute to me so that I can pay the school to pay me mm. so if they pay me then I can have my health insurance and everything else and I can continue to teach my kids mm. so I was one of many people who got this letter and you know you get so many requests for money and I remember opening the envelope and reading this. And I said, oh, just somebody else to help out and contribute money. And I remember holding it over the wastebasket. Wow. But, you know, that's how I got my start in music, in elementary school at the age of six. And the, the local music teacher, because... At that point in the 40s, California, had, where I grew up, had this fantastic school system. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids who went to private schools in New York uh, didn't get as good an education as I did, and certainly not arts and music. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my first lessons from a teacher. I don't even remember him. My, my, my parents said it was Mr. Singer. It's a nice apt name. Yeah. And at the end of the year, he said, you know, your your kid has talent. You should send him to a private teacher. And so that was the beginning. So I lifted the letter out of the wastebasket and I called Roberta Baspari. And she said, oh, I know who you are. Oh, it would be lovely if you would come. So I came to the class and I said, kids, Arnold Steinart is here. He's a wonderful violinist. Just play, just hang out on your own while I speak to him. And so we spoke, and while we spoke, all these kids, there must have been 20 or 25 of them, they were like bees with their violins buzzing. And so they were all playing for one another. You know, it's not as if, oh, thank goodness, the teacher is out of the room. I don't have to do this horrible violin stuff, the squeaky violin stuff. They were so enthusiastic. Yeah, I, I was overwhelmed by it, and so I and by her. And so I got home and I said to my wife Dorothea, who's a photographer, "You've got to come see this group." So she 
took pictures of it, uh, of, of the kids and of Roberta. And we said, we've got to do something. We've got to help this person out. And we had no experience fundraising, raising money, creating an event. And it was supposed to be at the 92nd Street Y, and they double booked and they canceled us. And so I went to Wally Scheuer, who was the pro producer of our uh, Guarneri documentary, High Fidelity. Yeah. yeah. He was a very wealthy man who was a great supporter of the arts. And I told him, Wally, this is what happened. Can you help out? He said, well, I'm on the board of Carnegie Hall. Let's do it in Carnegie Hall. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, it turned out they said, I'll do it, but I want to make a documentary out of it. And the documentary is wonderful, called mm -hmm. Small Wonders. And then Hollywood picked it up and Meryl Streep became R Roberta Guaspari. And how did she study to be Roberta Guaspari? She said, Roberta, let's go shopping. And they went shopping in, for four hours in Manhattan. And at the end, Meryl said, I've got her personality down. <laughs> wow. Shop for four hours. Shop for four hours. Shop until we drop. That's right. That's a great story. <laughs> and so for us, it was, uh, for Dorothea and I, it was a thrill. And, and it was great because of my beginnings. You know, you don't expect everybody who takes up an instrument to become a professional. Most don't. But it doesn't matter. That's not the point of it at all. Mm -hmm. Music is part of the human condition. What society, advanced, not advanced, primitive, sophisticated, doesn't have music? Right. And so the cultivation of music, and, and you could see it in the kids' concerts. They were thrilled, you know, to be part of this whole thing. Um, so that was the Opus 118. Mm -hmm. experience for the kids and, and uh, our involvement and they're still going strong good good and I, I i i truly resonated with that when i know when that was being formed and and i i because i wanted to start up a similar program and i, I want to hear from you what what is music good for <laughs> i know that's a broad question but you know, i've asked that you know it doesn't put a roof on your head. It doesn't feed you. You can procreate without it, although... <laughs> it could help. Right? It could help right? <laughs> so what the hell is it good for? And people come backstage... Well, no, I'll, I'll tell a, a, another story. I think this was the second to the last concert we played just before we our quartet retired. And it was in the South someplace. And, and this would uh, be in 2009, probably. I think that was your last, yeah. 2009. Right. And the first piece on the program was a Mozart quartet, one of the famous Mozart quartets. And I found out after the concert that after we finished the first quartet, a young girl who was maybe nine or 10 years who was there with her parents in the orchestra section. As we the audience began to clap, she burst out crying and raced up the aisle to the lobby. And her parents were very worried what had happened to her. And they rushed up behind her and they said, what happened to you? She said, nothing happened to me. The music was so beautiful. And this was somebody, uh, a kid who hadn't been exposed to music, certainly mm. hadn't been exposed to Mozart. And I mean, at that point, her life was changed. Mm. And so, you know, having had different experiences that were emotional for people because of the music we were playing or as I sometimes refer to my uh, to ourselves, musicians as midwives, we're delivering the baby. 
Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Not our baby, yeah. <laughs> but we're delivering it. And I, I, I begin to think sometimes that we're not in the entertainment business. We're in the healing. Yes. We're, in the medical, we're in the medical business, in the healing business. And I guess that's what music is good for, certainly. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful healing. It can make you dance, want to dance. It can make you want to cry. It stirs up things in you. And sometimes it's almost scary for a kid. I mean, I, I was taken to hear Misha Elman, who was a reigning concert violinist in yeah. earlier times, to hear him play a recital in Los Angeles. And it was mostly with piano, but at one point the piano was taken out of the stage, off the stage, and Misha reappeared and played the Chacon of Bach. And he was almost scary for me as a nine or 10 year old, 11 year old kid, because the emotions that I felt, I had never felt before. Mm-hmm. And I thought this, this little man, he looked like the stage manager, not like a violin, yeah. a, a, a glamorous violinist, you know, he was bald and he was this short and funny looking, uh, but what came out of this little violin was extraordinary. And of course he got a standing ovation at the end. And I mean, that, that changed that performance of the Chacon changed my life in, in effect, because I went to bed and I I had, you know, I'd practiced the violin since I was six, but I thought, Oh, well, I love music, but what a drag to practice at that point. I thought, you know, it would be nice to be a concert violinist. So that, in a way, that's not the point of my my little story here. It's the idea that music is an overwhelmingly expression-filled dimension of our lives. And if we can be exposed to it, all the better. And for those, I feel sorry for those who aren't exposed to it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be classical music. It could be Billie Holiday singing. Right. Yeah, the Art Tatum's or Earl Father Hines mm-hmm. at the piano. Wow, that's a beautiful answer to that. What is music good for? I, I, and I actually led me to another question because I know you've done a lot of performances specifically on the Chaconne and about the Bach Chaconne. Mm-hmm. What does that work mean to you? Because you just brought it up about an early hearing it at the age of, what was it, nine or 10. What does it mean to you, the Chacon? He didn't write many. Um, there, as I understand that there's one in the cantata, and then he wrote a, a Pasacaglia for organ, I think that's basically a, a Chacon. It's, 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 it's a figure that kept on... <laughs> repeated over and over again as variations it's yeah. always always different but there is a theory that he was when he was employed by prince leopold and he had his own little orchestra that he led as a violinist prince leopold was apparently a sickly man and he went off at one point to a spa in bohemia Mm-hmm. And he took along his orchestra. I think it's a nice idea, Michael, when you go on vac- vacation to take your orchestra with you, don't you? Definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I never thought of the idea but... before, but, you know, it would be nice. You know? <laughs> so he took Bach and, and his orchestra along, and he yeah. was there for two months without communication, and Bach was married to Maria Barbar, his first wife, and they had already had seven children, as I remember. And he came back to find his wife not only dead, but already buried. Mm-hmm. And the, the experts have figured out that the Chacon, which is the last movement of the D minor partita, is written on different paper. Mm. that could have been only written afterwards, after her death, according okay. to when the paper was printed. I don't know how they find these things out. But 
the theory is that the Chacon was a way of expressing his grief for his wife's death. Mm. Can't be proven. Mm. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense, you know, the, the stages of yeah. grief. Yeah, art. Oh, that, you know, have been bandied about, you know, in, in articles, denial and acceptance and mourning and, and all that goes on with with the process of grieving for somebody you've lost who, who's meaningful to you. It's all there in the Chacon. It is. All all the all the elements of, of grief. Mm-hmm. And there's one point toward the end of the piece, which is in minor, and then it's in major, and then it's in minor again, where some people think this is a triumphant point where it has to be be played loudly and assertively. And for me, it's exactly the opposite. It's the low point of the piece Mm. where uh, all the variations starting from the last D minor section, dwindle in effect until you get this place where, and I always feel this, that Bach has hit his bottom. Mm-hmm. And that there's no further place that he can go with his grief. And that slowly, he says, there has to be a renewal of life, which gradually takes place as the piece moves inevitably toward this end and at the end there's a triumph of life over death in a way mm-hmm. they said the, the spirit of life has to move on and yeah. and flourish and then of course the theme comes back at the end and anything that anything in music that comes back even if it's identical which is not quite but almost identical has to have a different meaning yes because it's happened again, you know, aha, this is what I experienced before, and now I experience it in a different way. I, I identify strongly with his feelings for his first wife, Maria Barbara, and Dorothea and I went to the, to the place where she's buried, and I played the Chacon for her. And wow. This, this headstone on her, in the park where, 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 the, where she is, and I finished it, and she didn't thank me for it. She didn't say anything. <laughs> but yes. I didn't expect anything from her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no it expectations. It was a wonderful experience for me, I must say. That must have been incredible. Ashes to ashes. Right? Yeah, ashes yes. To- yeah. Wow. Well, that's beautiful. I- what kind of music do you listen to to unwind? <laughs> I'm reluctant to say this, but almost the last thing I want to hear is a string quartet performance. (laughs) I I want to hear music that I don't know well Mm. or that I want to know better. I'd rather educate myself uh, to, to know different pieces of music. And, and that often includes jazz. What would be the last piece that you'd want to hear if you'd have something for my for my funeral? Well, I don't know if you can hear at your funeral, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe before the funeral. <laughs> I I was thinking of writing two different blogs. One would be titled This is going to kill you. <laughs> which would be the last piece that a composer wrote before he died. Mm-hmm. And there are some pretty amazing pieces of Yes. Music. You know, like Beethoven's Quartet Opus 135, and yeah. Mozart's Requiem. Schubert would be there, and maybe it would be as a complete piece, the two cello quintets. Or, or Haydn, you know, who, who kept on churning out these masterpieces uh, as, as an old man. But the other blog that I might consider writing is, what do you want to be have played at your funeral? Okay. <laughs> and there was a Tin Pan Alley composer 
who arranged for the party after, I think it was a woman, after her death, and she arranged to have played Don't Get Around Much Anymore. That would be a blog. So what no. do you want to have played at your funeral, Michael? I, I, oh. I, probably, I probably would want one of the slow moments from Bach. I love the D minor Sarah Bond. I mm -hmm. love the, the slow movement of the, the A minor. The C major, the sort of slow movement. I, I love all those slow movements. So I, I might want something like that. And I've actually played that at a few funerals. So, but I'm thinking beyond that because I really think vibrations are all around us. Like there's music everywhere. I'm looking at a beautiful magnolia tree. And if there's a little electrode you can put in the soil right by the tree and clip it to the leaf. And all of a sudden, it'll start getting the vibrations of the tree and musical notes will be created. Just, that sounds good. Yeah, just to feel the, feel the resonance of the earth around us. Nice. The music, because actually music is a, what did you say, a human condition? Right? Yeah. Well, maybe it's an earthly condition too. And, and there's music that we don't even know it's all inspiring around us. Right. So. <laughs> That's very interesting to answer. This is a dream come true for me. Creating this podcast, having you on it is just fantastic. And I, I love being able to hear your conversation, your stories, your wisdom, and always a teacher to me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.